the HL7 Project Management Office. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. Today, we'll have a panel discussion on state implementation of patient access API. And it's brought to you by Kelly Taylor, Micah Jones, and Ken Lane. Kelly, are you ready to begin? Hey, thanks, Dave. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the session. Uh, looking forward to talking to everybody. Um, I've just put a couple of links in the chat and um, please feel free to kind of raise your hand, ask questions. We have a bunch of fun stuff to talk about, but we can keep it super informal and, and uh, Q&A like if, if people want. Um, so my name is Kelly. I'm the director of a team called the Colorado Digital Service. It's this small team of nerds, uh, engineers, designers, product managers uh, that work for Governor Polis here in Colorado on a couple of different things. And one of those is, is the, the Medicaid APIs. Um, the last couple of years, um, I ended up in DC at the US Digital Service where in all my work there was with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. And while I was there, I, I had a chance to work with some of the awesome people here I recognize like Dave Hill and Mark Scrimshire and, and uh, Carl Davis and others on the CMS Medicare um, Blue Button API and roll that out. And it was this amazing experience and I learned a ton about fire resources and um, you know, how healthcare developers wanna consume claims data. And um, also while I was there, I got to work on the CMS interoperability rule. And um, after that experience, I, I moved back to Colorado to start this team. And um, now I'm on the other side of the table where the, you know, as part of the Medicaid team, uh, we are now, you know, required to implement this rule. Um, so it's been this really interesting kind of journey through explanation of benefit resource and, and coverage resource and other things. And, uh, and you know, kind of while I was going through that experience, um, I had a chance to hang out a little bit with one of my old friends, Ken Lane, uh, API evangelist. And uh, Ken and I had this wonderful meeting in, in um, Baltimore where we were talking all about, you know, open API and fire standards. So Ken, can you say a quick hello? Sure, hello. Thanks for having me, Kelly. Uh, yeah, that was, uh, I would say that was kind of halfway through my journey, my exposure with FIRE. So I was introduced early on. Um, I was worked for the Obama administration at Department of Veterans Affairs. But while I was there working on, on health care standards, I went over to uh, Health and Human Services and I was getting an early look at what was going to happen. And so I had my finger on the pulse for a while, but I mean, to be honest, I really didn't feel like it was going to go anywhere. I follow a lot of standards bodies and early on, I just didn't see the industry nod that, that I normally see when it comes to these. And then about the time we met, you know, I started seeing more momentum occurring and it was really good, you know, it energized me and my, my view of it to, to meet your team. And then uh, we just kind of continued to work after that. And I had you guys out to API strategy and practice our conference uh, talking about it. And, um, and then, you know, I started seeing vendors uh, talking more about it, about fire and, and what was happening. And then now with, with, with the CMS rules, it's, uh, it's definitely I, not only is there momentum, but I think we're, we're really setting the stage to, to be a leader in the world when it comes to not just healthcare, but, but API standards as well. And, and Ken talks a lot about the parallels with banking to across Europe, which, which is super interesting. We'll talk a little bit about later. And, and um, so as I, as I came back to Denver from, from that amazing adventure in DC, I started hanging out with my buddy, Micah. And Micah is, is a Medicaid IT expert, lawyer, technologist, all the things. And, and uh, so Micah leads up our, the state of Colorado's implementation of the CMS interoperability and patient access rule here. And so Micah has really had, the, had a chance to kind of consume the rule and, and really start to think through, you know, how to actually build this. And um, so Micah, um, first of all, hello. Good to see you again for the millionth time virtually this week. And, um, you know, so this is going to be one of the first publicly facing APIs that the state of Colorado has. It'll be the first one, I think, from Medicaid. Um, 
So can you tell us a little bit about the CMS interoperability rule and what it means for states? Sure. Thanks, Kelly. And thanks for having me today. I'm honored to be here on this panel and talking with um, all, all the people listening today and watching us today. Um, hopefully you can learn a little bit about the perspective of states um, and what it is that we're dealing with and how um, at least one state, Colorado, is approaching our implementation um, to um, the, inter the CMS interoperability rule and what that means uh, for the long term and the direction that states are possibly going to go. So as Kelly was saying, my name is Micah Jones. I'm with the Colorado Department of Healthcare Policy and Financing, and we administer the Medicaid and the CHIP programs. Um, a little bit about myself. I've been working in health IT for about four years now, so I'm a bit of a newbie. I am a lawyer. I came to Colorado Medicaid from private practice where I was actually representing um, healthcare facilities, skilled nursing facilities, um, you know, helping them get their, get their Medicaid uh, payments if there's a disallowance, helping with mergers and acquisitions. I also dabbled a little bit in, in health IT as well, um, a little, mostly privacy and security, thinking about um, personal health records and whatnot. And when I made my way to the Medicaid agency, I actually started out working with um, Medicaid members who are at the intersection of the jails program. So jails and homelessness. After Medicaid was expanded, that um, made Medicaid available to adults without dependent children. And that allowed people um, who were in corrections to be eligible for the Medicaid program and homeless folks as well. Um, and so we were doing like a lot of really interesting um, activities with that, including trying to get their, their data and criminogenic data into our systems for greater care coordination. That's really what got me started down the, down the road of health IT, working on that. So from there, I eventually moved on to be the program manager of Colorado's EHR incentive program. So I got the opportunity to work with our electronic health records um, in our state and um, ho eligible hospitals and eligible providers that are using the major vendors in Colorado. It also gave me the opportunity to work with Colorado's two health information exchanges. Those are Carrillo and the Quality Health Network. Um, Colorado has um, an overall uh, health IT ecosystem that is centered around our HIE. So that's something that's very important as we talk about um, the interoperability rule and APIs. Um, we're very HIE based, uh, especially for our clinical data. Um, and then we also have other agencies in the state as well, pre, um, specifically um, in, within the governor's office, which is the Office of eHealth Innovation, which uh, coordinates public and private sector health IT initiatives and coordinates initiatives across agencies as well. So the interoperability rule work that I'm doing today um, is possibly going to have implications for the overall healthcare community in Colorado. Medicaid really is just gonna be the jumping off point for that. Um, with that said, uh, one thing else I want to, and I'm gonna put this on uh, Kelly and Ken um, to keep me honest here is that I use a lot of acronyms. Uh, people in government use a ton of acronyms. So if I'm using an acronym, Kelly, you know, just let me know uh, and then I will, and then I will uh, cor correct myself. So, <clears throat> So to, to give a little bit of background on interoperability rule, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this. I know that you guys have talked about this in other sessions today, but for those of you who may be joining for this for the first time. So the interoperability rule or the CMS patient access to interoperability rule is a federal mandate that requires Medicaid agencies and other federal plans, for example, like Medicare Advantage plans or uh, qualified health plans that are on a federally facilitated exchange, so the marketplace, um, those plans or impacted plans have to allow members, our members to access their adjudicated claims or encounter data via a third party application. The intent of this rule is to help patients more easily access their health claims information that are going across systems. So there's a huge, huge issue with data being siloed here, there, everywhere. And this is really the federal government's start in trying to make sure that 
Um, the consumers are at the center of their healthcare information and they're the ones directing the exchange. So um, a term that I'm gonna be using throughout the time that I'm speaking is consumer directed exchange. Uh, that is ultimately, uh, for, for, in my mind, that is ultimately the goal, consumer directed exchange. With that said, um, Colorado and many other states, um, from what I can tell, um, in addition to consumer uh, consumer directed exchange, we're also thinking about like the bigger picture as well. So we see applications for um, the interoperability rule in the future to move the needle to allow us to do more efficient um, provider to provider exchange, payer to provider exchange, payer to payer exchange as well, which will have um, you know great. Um, benefits to our members, save them time, save them a lot of hassle. I'm going to be talking about some stories today from some Medicaid members who, uh, or, or not even necessarily Medicaid members, but just people who are struggling with being able to download their own medical records. They may be able to view it, but they are unable to even download it and print it out um, in, the simple, uh, in the simplest manner possible. And that's something that really needs to change. So this is a rule that's hopefully gonna push everyone to that direction along with um, the um, a concurrent rule that was um, promulgated by um, another federal agency, the Office of the National Coordinator, um, their information blocking rule. So it's really good to think about the information blocking rule and the interoperability rule as items that work in tandem that are designed to get um, data flowing. So as I said, there's um, benefits in encouraging data liquidity and patient um, empowerment first and foremost. Uh, this rule also aligns with Colorado's other goals. Um, we have a primary goal um, in Colorado. It comes down from our governor, Jared Polis, of saving people money on health care. It's, it's like, it's that simple. We just wanna say, we wanna save members money on healthcare. We wanna save the state money. Um, there's just so much money that's being wasted in the system. And we're trying to figure out ways to, you know, to, to limit that. Um, it also fits into, with well, the interoperability rule also fits into Colorado and Colorado Medicaid's health data strategy uh, for modernizing our health information exchange technology to allow for seamless and easy clinical data exchange. As I said, we have health information exchanges in Colorado currently, we have two of them. Um, they are dabbling in, um, H in, in HL7 Fire and APIs, but as we um, develop more experience with developing APIs, um, we hopefully plan on modernizing the entire infrastructure to be more based on these APIs to get that clinical data um, in addition to the claims data that the Medicaid agency has to make available um, to get that clinical data in our HIEs moving to where that data needs to be, um, specifically providers and also to the members themselves if they prefer to have their clinical data. Um, and then there's also aspects where we see that there may be um, using APIs, which would help us with our analytics and our population health um, details. But I'm going to like uh, stop a little bit there and talk about what the current landscape is, um, how members get their uh, data from the Medicaid agency today, because again, this is impacting us and this is going to not really calls it like a change in our processes, but more of like um, a change or an additional modality to allow members to get their data. So how does it work today before the rule, is, before the interoperability rule has been impl implemented? So say we have a Medicaid member, um, her name's Liza. Like, so Liza is a single mother. Her and her son face housing instability, which causes them to have to move fairly frequently. Um, she has to move quite a bit, you know, because uh, to find to find work um, in various cities. Um, Liza finds a job opportunity, um, but it will require her to move from her home in Denver to um, another city with her mother. Um, and that city's in Grand Junction, Colorado, which is about 300 miles away from Denver. 
Um, obviously, Liza is going to have to um, find a new medical provider in this situation. So say, for example, Liza moves to Grand Junction. So she wants to find um, a new provider. And to prepare for that, she decides that she wants to get all of her claims records from the Medicaid agency so that she can go prepared because she knows the provider is going to ask her a litany of questions like what it um, like has she been um, has she been vaccinated, um, what medication she's had and whatnot. So she knows like all this is going to happen. So she wants to pull her data. Great, we can do that. Um, but the process for that today is manual. So Liza would have to request her PHI in writing. And that could be via email, um, but it still has, they still have to actually request it in writing. That request um, eventually goes to the agency's privacy officer, who is the one that actually processes the request. So the privacy officer is gonna have to verify Liza's identity, obviously. And after Liza has been verified, the privacy officer then has 30 days um, to provide Liza um, her data um, in a format that, um, that Liza needs it, um, assuming that all the data is actually in that format. Uh, the data that we would provide to Liza um, would include her Medicaid ID number, um, date of service, uh, her provide, the provider that, um, that administered the service, what category of service it is, and the payment amount. Um, and this is really like a process that, again, we have up to 30 days to do that. Um, I know the, for those of you who are paying attention, I know that the rules are actually changing that and cutting that down to 15 days, but still, it's still gonna be a lot longer for someone who's facing a medical emergency or someone who needs to suddenly move. Right? It's still gonna be a long period of time. And say if for whatever reason, um, the Medicaid agency takes needs longer than 30 days in order to pour the data. Um, you know, we would have to reach out to Liza and let her know why we need longer than 30 days and give her a timeline on when we'd be able to get her her data. But as you can see, we'd be she'd be facing a situation where she might be going um, up to 60 days before she receives her health information data that she has a right to under HIPAA. So as you guys can all see, um, that's not the best process in the world. And the beauty of the interoperability rule is that it's gonna automate a lot of that process. It's not gonna completely eliminate the process. Not everybody has a smartphone. Not everyone's gonna wanna use an app on their desktop. Some people are just are gonna wanna go um, and do with the manual process. Um, and that's still going to remain. I'll bet um, we'll have 15 days as opposed to 30 days. But for so many other people that want to be able to get their data seamlessly and easily and in a pinch, this is going to be a rule that, that allows us to automate that. And so it's going to be uh, the, the interoperability rule um, requires us to um, adhere to standards. So we have to um, meet Fire API uh, version four standards. Um, and then we also have to meet um, authentication standards as well. So the SMART framework, which leverages OAuth and OpenID are the standards that we have to use. Uh, we are also um, gonna be following what are called implementation guides. I'm sure you guys talked about implementation guides during this, um, during this conference as well. So, the federal government um, is, in some cases, requiring states to follow certain implementation guides, um, including um, impl implementation guides for like the FIRE standard and the SMART framework. Um, but there's also suggested um, or informally endorsed implementation guides. I can't say that they are endorsed because technically they are not, but um, we have had informal guidance. States have received informal guidance that says if they follow um, a certain implementation guide called the Karen Alliance Blue Button Implementation Guide, uh, we would be likely to be found in compliance with the rule. And so for a state in particular, um, 
you know, that's new to this space, like all states are. I, I think very few state, I'll speak for state Medicaid agencies. Kelly, he's in Colorado. He knows a lot about this stuff, but state Medicaid agencies are new to this stuff. So when thinking about how uh, we're implementing this for the first time, there are gonna be compliance issues we'd be risking with getting disallowances to our funding um, and getting in trouble with the feds. Uh, a lot of states, their first goal, first and foremost, is just gonna be compliance. And those implementation guides are going to be really key to that because we know that if we follow those guides, we would reach compliance and we're not going to have to worry about penalties. Things that happen on top of that, on top of the implementation guides, um, are also going to occur, um, you know, concurrently, if, depending on the resources of the state um, and, uh, and their API strategy, if they have one, or maybe even after uh, the initial compliance uh, with the rule. So with all that being said, so again, this is going to open up the door for more consumer-driven exchange. Uh, and to repeat, the federal vision is for healthcare consumers to easily direct their claims and encounter information between health plans um, to their provider of their choice through common technology. So we're looking at your smartphones, your home computers, laptops, tablets. Um, and again, it's gonna be just information. It's mostly gonna be like the explanation of benefit um, information that um, any Medicaid member would receive. Uh, you all, like if, if you have private insurance, your private insurance provides you an explanation of benefits. Oftentimes they may mail it to you. They might provide it in email through, uh, through a portal. Uh, but in Colorado, um, our explanation of benefits is gonna be made available through this API. Um, before uh, pitch, pitching it back on to Kelly, I do wanna talk a little bit about how Colorado got to where we currently are with, the, with our implementation of the rule. So we've been working on implementing this rule for quite some time now. We've been thinking about it for about two years since it was a proposed rule. Uh, I remember um, a few years ago, um, I had this random, random meeting um, uh, in downtown Denver with Anish Chopra um, and some representatives from CMS, and they wanted to talk about uh, this brand new rule um, building off of the Medicare blue button um, and all of that in that framework. And I just remember having that conversation with my boss at the time, Chris Underwood. Um, and we're very, very excited about this work. Um, one of the reasons why we we're so excited about it is because we've been thinking about patient engagement and patient empowerment for quite some time. In fact, at the time, one of the projects that I was spearheading was working on a Medicaid personal health record. Um, uh, particularly at this time, personal health records were kind of already on their way on the outs because it's a portal. Um, and the federal government was moving away from funding portals and moving towards standards and APIs. So the, with our conversations with the niche and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, also known as CMS, um, you know, we saw this as an opportunity to allow us to pivot from a PHR, personal health record portal, to doing something that is innovative, um, and really meets people where they are. And for me personally, I think that that is one of the, the coolest things about this rule is that the, the option of allowing people to use the app of their choice means that there's more opportunity to meet people where they are. And I really think that that is the key um, to empowerment. So we started thinking about, we started after our conversations with the niche, um, and the and the proposed initial proposed rule came out. We immediately started thinking about like, okay, how are we going to implement this? We're not familiar with APIs. We're we're new to APIs. Um, there are other folks in the state that can help us. Like Kelly um, has like great information, and Kelly is able to connect us to with uh, folks like Ken, um, who who are a wealth of knowledge. But 
one of the things that we have to think about as a state is we had to think about who currently has our data, where is our data currently warehoused, and what we could do with our, with our existing vendors. So we had to map out, we ended up mapping out like this initial framework um, that was, it was incredibly uh, federated and it was just this really uh, cumbersome model that um, over time, as we vetted it over time, um, we focused on alternatives and thinking about how we could streamline this um, model to make it simpler. Um, and long story short, it took us about a year um, in order to reformulate like what we think our architecture um, should look like. So I say that to you to also put it in perspective that, um, again, that this is something that's new for states. And we're really figuring all of this stuff out um, as we go uh, leveraging as, much, as many resources as we can with Kelly, Ken, um, our federal partners at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and a niche. So with, um, with that said, you know, if you guys are, you know, working with states, reaching out to states, you know, I just want you to be aware that they're in various different stages of their implementations. Colorado, we were very early, but we're still not as far along as we thought we would be back then, um, again, because this stuff is new. Um, but with that said, um, today we are um, on track to um, have an implementation, um, hopefully a, a full implementation, um, hopefully like really soon, and we're very excited for the potential of these APIs and to see how this moves the needle. And we're, and we're also excited about the future APIs that we think are gonna springboard um, from this work. So um, with that said, I think I rambled on for long enough. Kelly, back to you. Thank you, Mike. I, I was hoping to get that, that story from you of just the journey and just to give everybody kind of a sense of how things unfold in state government. You know, in Colorado, we have um, our state Medicaid agency that Micah was talking about that pays claims, but we also have seven other, you know, managed Medicaid um, companies in, in Colorado. So depending on where you are in Colorado, like you're signing up and, and getting serviced by a different company. And so just in Colorado now, we're like a mid-sized state. There's eight different potential developer experiences, developer portals. Right now, times that by 50 and like what's happening in California and these are huge states like so we've been thinking a lot about um, the developer experience for Colorado like we just stood up developer.colorado.gov for the first time and it just like redirects to kind of this basic MuleSoft portal like we we have a couple of people that are really good at building APIs here but that's pretty much it you know and, and the way we look at it is APIs is really the next huge chapter of GovTech, where the last, you know, five years or so has been all about building digital services and, and digitizing things that used to be paper in person. This next chapter is government as the data holder, building APIs to unlock a lot of this data, uh, in not just health data, but all sorts of different domains. And um, so I've been talking to Ken a lot about, um, you know, j just the use of standards and the importance of that. Um, in this rule and also you know what it's like for a developer so if you're if you're a company that has a product that serves medicaid members across the united states are you about to go to like hundreds of developer portals and set up for an account and sandbox and do all that stuff or, or what's going to happen there so can maybe talk for a few minutes just about the open API initiative and some of the standards work you've been you've been working on and just kind of your your, your general you know advice or, or opinions about what states should be thinking about when it comes to developer experience and kind of what to expect. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I mean, APIs are you know government. I would say is about you know on average five to ten years slightly behind where the rest of the space is at in my experience and APIs. I've been studying them full time since 2010. Once I started seeing the Amazons, uh, the Twitters, the Facebooks, all of these, uh, you know, Salesforce emerging on the space, and APIs were their their secret sauce. It's it's how they did what they did they do. But you mentioned what is this like for developers? Is 
when you're trying to build an app that works with, you know, even just Twitter and Facebook, which are two social uh, APIs or social platforms, um, they're very different APIs. So think of think of APIs as kind of like a menu, you know, in, in, in the way that just a menu is standardized ordering food from a restaurant. And imagine if you had to go into different restaurants and everyone had, you know, 20, 30 different ways of ordering food. Well, you had to go out back, you had to, you know, go write something on the chalkboard. Menus have standardized somewhat how we order uh, within a restaurant. So APIs are doing that for businesses. Businesses have their public APIs, they have their internal APIs, they have their partner APIs. And that's how you, you know what resources are available. But it, there's still many different types of APIs. So what we're seeing across industries is the standardization of those, those menus so that you have appetizer, you have entree, you have kind of standard groupings, naming and ordering. Uh, so people are speaking a, a common domain vocabulary. Uh, 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 so it's familiar to everybody in the domain, but then anybody new coming to the domain, you know, a new developer can quickly get up to speed. And you're seeing uh, API standards emerge in, uh, well, payments and banking has been one of the, the leading, so PSD2 in Europe, and we see CFPB working on similar rules here in the US, standardizing when someone is providing an API for ATM location. In the UK and in Europe, that's the same API. It has the same naming and ordering and grouping. Uh, credit card information, so standardizing that um, we see this happening in the travel industry right now. They're taking advantage of, of uh, the, the COVID kind of shift in their industry. And you see open travel as a standard emerging. Now, one common thing that the, all these industries have with, uh, you know, HL7 Fire for healthcare is they're using another standard, a specification called open API. So all, all one word. Um, not to be confused with just open APIs or public APIs, but open API is this actual specification that was formerly known as Swagger. Some people still call it Swagger, um, but it got put in 2015, we put it into the Linux Foundation um, and it went from Swagger and it became open API specification. And so you can describe uh, the fire specification using open API. You can describe PSD2 using Open API. You can describe Open Travel, and so what it Open API does is it provides a common vocabulary for developers, uh, API providers to share with their consumers, and it helps get everyone on the same page about what is Fire, uh, what is a, is a subsection or part of Fire, and so Open API. Um, in, in the easy, in the most common sense, most people think of it as documentation. It's how you document your API, but it really is so much more than that. And for uh, for or organizations looking to do APIs that don't understand APIs and don't understand developers' needs, really lean on Open API because it provides a the documentation for your API, but b it also provides the ability to create sandboxes. Um, virtualized environments with synthetic data so that developers can play with it without worrying about, uh, P, you know, access to PII and PHI. Um, it allows you to generate code in a variety of programming languages, Python, Ruby, you know, the language that these developers speak. Um, it allows you to test and certify APIs and go, that is a compliant FHIR API It actually speaks the FHIR vocabulary. And so open API is, is how you provide that fire vocabulary in a way that developers are going to get. And not just because the fire speaks open API, it's because GitHub is using open API for their APIs. It's because eBay, Amazon, Facebook, Twitter, and developers are familiar with this and they know they can grab that open API definition and get what they need done and get it done as quickly and efficiently as possible. And so, um, I'm really, you know, keen on helping uh, providers in the API space uh, understand it uh, across all states, but then uh, other industries as well, because like we're seeing the overlap with other industries in the COVID passport, um, open travel has a subset called fire specification just for the, the COVID passport part, so you can travel. So this standards are really important for providers, for consumers, 
but also just for the industries that they operate in and the overall economy and how these industries work together. You know, one of the, the most interesting things being on the CMS side, working on the rule, um, I was like, oh, you know, it, it wasn't too bad to build the CMS blue button API. Like we, you know, we had to map some data and then we had to do a bunch of like marketing and, you know, talking at conferences and really trying to get people to use it and, and all that stuff. And, uh, and the thing I really didn't think through was how this was going to be the first API ever for most states. States don't have developer portals. They don't have teams that have ever done anything like this before. And really this API as a product stuff is, is all brand new. So it's really interesting to look at this, this first rule from CMS being like the beginning of this roadmap. You know, you look at these other proposed rules and there's like, there's like 10 APIs on this roadmap from CMS just in, in healthcare. So, you know, for states, so it, it's super interesting to kind of think through you know, this next chapter and it's going to be really interesting how states can collaborate together or, or what's going to happen to make life for developers easier um, for this type of thing. And I, I wanted to, to ask you, Micah, kind of one more thing bef before we wrap up. And, and by the way, if you have any questions for, for Ken or Micah, you know, go ahead and raise your hand. Um, you know, building the API is one thing, building the, the developer portal with code samples and, you know, a developer forum and documentation is one thing. But then with this rule comes like these business processes, like, you know, at CMS, you know, how do we, how do we approve a developer for production access to the CMS Medicare API? You know, we, we came up with a process, we ran it by the lawyers and said like, can we do this? And like, yeah, we looked at a bunch of other companies to watch, to see what they did. And we kind of modeled it. So now do we see each state coming up with their own set of business processes and like that stuff? So maybe just talk for a minute you know, maybe not necessarily too deep in the specifics of each process, but, but more like as the state, you know, how do you, how do you approach these problems? You know, like how do you, how do you collaborate and, and um, to come up with ways, you know, path forward for this stuff? Cause it, it's, it's new and it's, it's complicated for states. Yeah. Thanks Kelly. So it is new. And um, I would probably say that it would, because it is so new um, and we're uncertain about compliance that it would be easy for states to overthink things. Um, the rules are fairly clear and cut and dry for a lot of aspects of it. So um, for example, um, app vetting. Uh, for the most part, the rule does not give states a lot of leeway to reject um, app, app, apps that um, want to connect to our API unless that app would pose a security risk to our overall, our overall systems. So we don't have a ton of flexibility in, you know, saying like um, picking and choosing who, what developers um, can uh, develop apps for our state or what apps themselves we want to accept or reject. Um, the rules also talk about trust frameworks. So um, third-party app developers are not, are generally not going to be HIPAA-covered entities. So uh, there's a lot of discussions right now on trust, right? So uh, at, because these third-party apps are not covered entities, uh, a lot of particularly people who are health literate are going to understand that. And rightfully so, and they're also, and people are going to need to be educated on that as well. So rightfully so, they're going to want to know how is their data being protected. Um, and that is where I think states really need to be careful um, because uh, there are several trust frameworks that are out there that are designed to help build this trust. Um, one example of that is the Karen um, Alliance Trust Framework and Consent. Um, which they, which is a um, framework that they are um, promoting to all the states um, to see to get them to adopt um, a standardized uh, consent framework. So that's something that's really important. Um, going back to the implementation 
implementation of the API itself. Again, it goes back to these implement implementation guides. Um, we know that, I know that as long as I follow these implementation guides, that I'm going to meet compliance. Um, and so that is going to be first and foremost, the documents that I follow. Uh, there may be states out there that, you know, um, uh, might want to go above and beyond. They might want to um, not use the implementation guide and achieve compliance um, through other means. Um, that is a risk that's going to be out there. But from what I have seen, I don't think that that's going to be um, a major problem. I do think that states are going to be following these implementation guides. Um, and states are also going to be looking for support in vetting um, and approving um, apps. So again, this is a new space to us. We're not going to be in the best position to review apps. And so we're going to be looking to um, other consultants, other vendors to actually help us with that. Um, and one of the movements that is happening is that as states um, particularly coalesce around um, a set number of solutions, um, those solutions, particularly the end-to-end -end solutions, are going to provide a platform or a mechanism for apps to register or app developers to register their apps uh, for approval for multiple states. So we are thinking about that um, in Colorado in particular, as we're implementing, we're going to do everything that we can to implement something that is open and that allows as many uh, app developers to innovate and access our API, as long as they can do it without compromising our systems, um, we're going to try to be as open as possible. That's such an interesting idea. And, it, and you can apply it to all these different domains, right? So as data begins to open in government, do developers have to continue to go to all these different developer portals in every single state? Or can they, can they register once? And because of standards, it just works in the 33 states that have implemented it this way, just out of the box, right? I wonder what, what type of stuff we see and how that unfolds over the next couple of years. And I wanna end, Ken, maybe just a, a couple of words of advice to the development community on kind of anything else they should be thinking about, maybe for states as states are designing things and, and for developers as they're consuming this these APIs, um, you know, maybe, maybe a parting word or two. Yeah, I would say uh, just, you know, follow the standards bodies. I mean, HL7 Fire, but then openapis.org will help you with, with understanding the open API community across other industries. And I know you're very focused on, on healthcare and, and that's important, but definitely, you know, spend some time just uh, Googling your favorite uh, thing that you're interested in, plus the word API. You know, if you're into music, search for API. Uh, music plus APIs. If, if you're into, you know, geology and rock hounding, search for APIs, mapping, uh, because it really helps you see other things that are relevant and that you care about and that maybe aren't your your day-to-day -day job. And you'll start seeing other standards and other patterns. And when it comes to doing portals, documentation, other things, these are common building blocks across all industries. And you can learn a lot from, from the, the cross-pollination. So there's standards that are emerging for city data right now, you know, 311, 211 data, there's standards and, and that interoperability between cities. And so just, just study what, what's out there. There's a lot a wealth of knowledge. And, and once you start scratching, I think you'll, you'll find some interesting stuff. Awesome. Well, thanks, Ken. And thanks, Micah, for all your hard work on all of this. And um, Thanks to all of you that are building the tooling and, and working on developing the standards. You know, one of my favorite things to do is hang out in the Zulip chat in Fire and just watch the implementers work. I mean, it's it's so incredibly impressive and we get to benefit from all of your, your hard work. So thank you for that. And um, with that, I think that's all we have for today. There's a couple of links, like I said, in the in this session chat of the of the Wuhuva web app um, that can take you kind of along for some further reading. And um, that's that. Thanks, Ken, Micah, and Kelly. Um, just want to remind everyone to rate the session. It is available um, 
in the session in Whova. There is a button to rate the session and always uh, check out. Um, I always remind remind the speakers to check the Q&A and chat in Whova because somebody may come up with a question or comment later on. So you those those two areas of Whova are kept um, live for even after the event is over. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.